Hi, everyone. Before the episode begins, I just want to remind you to follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Marlene the Plant Lady and YouTube, Everything Gardening with Marlene Simon. And remember, please, please, please rate and review on iTunes and Spotify. That just helps the podcast get a notice by more people and then more people will become better gardeners. And that's what we all want. So enjoy the episode. Look at that plant. I want you to know that everything was grown in my garden. Don't touch that plant! Is it poisonous? She'll become part of the plant. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Flower Power Garden Hour, and I'm your host, Marlene. And with me are uh, two people who get to work at a very special place, the San Francisco Conservatory of Flowers. So with me is Kristen Natoli and Sarah Sawtell. And... I'm going to let them introduce themselves, tell us what they do, and then we're going to go sort of into a little bit of the history of the conservatory. For those who have been there, you know that it's been around for a while. It's a beautiful conservatory. I go in there and I'm quite jealous. And the botanical conservatory where I work, we do trade with them. I think we went out a little bit more with getting plants from them. (laughs) I'm always like, ooh, I like this one. Ooh, I want that. Um, So thanks, gals, for joining me. Thank you, Marlene, for having us. Yes. Um, This is Kristen Natoli. I'm the chief nursery specialist at the Conservatory of Flowers, which means I'm responsible for the beautiful plants and the historic landmark building. And then Sarah, you want to Yeah, I'm Sarah Sattel. I'm the manager of engagement here. So my role includes our volunteer programs, our education programs for young people and adults, uh, and really sharing the stories of our plant collection here so that uh, Kristen's amazing work also translates into interpreting uh, why these plants are so special. Yeah, because I always say that every plant has a story and not only a story about you know, what it could be used for, but the history of it um, and just the acquisition history, like how did you get this plant? Why did you get this plant? And we're going to go into that a little bit. But for those who aren't aware, can you sort of um, briefly explain the conservatory of flowers, how long it's been there, how large it is, uh, where it's located? Yeah, so we are in Golden Gate Park in San Francisco. And uh, the conservatory is a massive uh, wood and glass uh, tropical greenhouse built in the Victorian style. And indeed, it was uh, assembled in 1879. So it's well over 140 years old at this point. And it may be that it's the oldest wood and glass conservatory in North America, uh, or at least one of them. It's hard to keep track of uh, all of them. But uh, were quite unique. And uh, yeah, this, I believe, was the first building here in Golden Gate Park on a spot that was designated for a conservatory and has been displaying tropical plants for most of its lifetime. Um, we can get a little more into the history if you'd like, or that's, that's sort of where we started. Um, and then one other thing about where we are now is the conservatory recently merged with the San Francisco Botanical Garden and the Japanese Tea Garden. So now um, we're part of what is called the Gardens of Golden Gate Park. So. Okay. So you guys did merge. I just have a friend who got hired by there. So woohoo. Uh, <laughs> um, so I, I saw on the news that yesterday was the 33rd anniversary of the Loma Prieta earthquake. That was in 1989. And then, you know, and I remember it being, I think, shut down for a while after the earthquake, if I'm not mistaken. But then I realized it's also gone through the 1906 earthquake as well. And- That's a great question, Marlene. Uh, this is Kristen. Um, in fact, the, the conservatory survived both earthquakes without too much damage. Mm-hmm. But what really took it down was in 1995, there was a major windstorm okay. in San Francisco. And that caused significant damage, or maybe to some extent revealed some underlying damage in the conservatory. And the conservatory was closed down at that point, you're correct, for uh, about eight years. I know for myself, I was watching the news when it shut down and thought that I would never be able to set foot in it again. It was really sad. And the, the great news is that the, the city came together to pull together the funds to rebuild, reconstruct 
from the ground up. It was major reconstruction and it reopened in 2003. So the building is 142 years old, but also um, just about 20 years old as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you have wood and glass, that that I imagine requires a lot of upkeep. So, okay. So eighty nine ninety five in my mind, I mean, when you get older, that just sort of all blurs together. So, okay. That makes sense now that it was a windstorm. I do remember that, but that's amazing during both earthquakes that not a lot of damage, but of course, wind took it out. But yeah, I think it's amazing as someone who loves old buildings. I'm so excited that the city did um, get their act together and are able to preserve it because it is so special and it is so old and there's just history in that. Now, what is the oldest plant in the conservatory? Do you know? Okay, so (laughs) that's a crazy question to answer for us um, because we have uh, interesting historic documents. Like we have a species list that were presented, like inventories that were presented to what the Board of Supervisors for San Francisco in the late 19th century that lists plants that we have in there today. We don't know if it's the same plants, but um, certainly we, we at least have some documentation about what plants were in the conservatory, similar to some of the plants we have today. Um, unfortunately, we don't have documentation about some of our older plants, but we have sort of what would you call it? Kind of internal cultural. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are Herbal. a few plants we know are quite old, <laughs> for sure. And, I, and we don't always like to uh, name numbers. But yeah. there is yeah. a, a vine of an uh, imperial philodendron uh, that we affectionately refer to as Phil. Uh, it's a plant that regularly sports six foot leaves. So um, not your household philodendron by any stretch. And it climbs all the way up to about the 60 foot tall uh, roof of the tallest point of the conservatory. And uh, that is one of the plants that we suspect could be one of the elder plants. Um, but once again, we don't have concrete uh documentation on it we definitely know it's uh, been around as long as living memory at least and then i think there are couples we a couple others that we have more solid information on the pygmy gate palm is another right that uh came to us by way of the panama pacific exposition which was what 1930 1915 so um that's one that we have a little more concrete information on and then the giant dune. Uh, do we I think a couple of the psych has are are reported to be over seventy five years old, and they're big, big, well developed specimens, which which suggests that that is true. That they are significantly, you know, have been been in the ground in the conservatory for a significant amount of time. Yeah. So I, it's it's confusing for us too. Like we have some old specimens that we know for sure. For some reason, we have this hibiscus in the hallway. That's like our oldest plant from 1964. Go, a, a tropical hibiscus outside, go figure. And then one of our Wellwichias. But then other than that, it sort of just gets a little, little lost. But, you know, our accession numbers have the dates, but it's sort of misleading there too, because a lot of times we'll take a cutting and restart a new plant. But we'll use the same accession number because that's when we got that plant species. So it's sort of misleading about the age of the plant sometimes. So I'm sure that happens too, is you might have a species, but then you're just propagating it to, you know, get a smaller one, a healthier species. And so, but, you know, when you're around for 140 years, people are going to ask, what's the oldest plant? <laughs> <laughs> we, can, <laughs> we can say that we've got some very old plants. Yeah. So how is the conservatory broken down into? So it's a tropical greenhouse, but you do have different rooms. And what are the um, the themes and, and the points of, of the different rooms? Yeah. So there are five distinct galleries here, and each of them does have its own theme and its own story. Um, so yeah, we could go on about each of them quite a lot, I'm sure, but uh, a quick overview would be um, when you first step into the building, you're in the lowland tropics, which is a low elevation tropical rainforest. And uh, that's the one that's uh, alight with the sounds of uh, lemurs and monkeys through a, a sound system and uh, lots of uh, plants with massive leaves that are stretching up to the canopy in search of sunlight. Um, If you go just to the east of that, you step up about 3,000 feet in elevation into uh, the highland tropics or or cloud forests. 
And that is uh, as though you're walking through a misty canopy of a uh, high elevation cooler, uh, tropical area with lots of epiphytes coating all of the trees and uh, vines in that space. And then continuing on, I'll uh, I'll give it to Kristen's, Kristen's gallery. I don't, I don't want to say she, but there is a, a sense of uh, ownership, right? <laughs> a little bit of sense of ownership. So the aquatics gallery, where, um, which, you know, the, the, the conservatory has had an aquatics gallery since it was first built, some big ponds inside the gallery that were originally there to um, display the giant water lily, Victoria Amazonica, which had just really made it to the U.S., um, not long before the conservatory was built. And um, so we still have ponds today and we uh, feature the giant water lily along with other aquatic plants. And Sarah mentioned uh, this being my favorite place. So um, we'll get into it more, but each of the horticulturists here have an assigned gallery and aquatics mm. is my favorite place to be on earth. <laughs> it is the warmest wettest gallery we have so plants that can't that you rarely see outside of a terrarium will just thrive in that space wow. um, so yeah my favorite place you want to go back to the other two <laughs> yeah areas? so then if you head back to the other side um of lowlands so now we're going west uh there's the potted plants gallery and i like to describe that as the first three galleries we just talked about are all distinct ecosystems and stepping into potted plants is like taking a step back in time to uh, Victorian era of potted plant displays. Um, and also really it's a gallery of very curious plants. We feature a lot of carnivorous plants. There's a magnificent arbor that has many orchids on every surface, um, plants that are climbing over the roof of it. There's a pretty good collection of ant plants in there. Uh, and then just a lot of unique individuals, so quite a few Morphophallus species, so a little focal points and all displayed in pots, and the, that gallery is a lot of fun because it's constantly changing. It's, it's very easy to bring pets in and out of that, uh, that space. And then last but not least, the West Gallery um, is a, sort of a, a little bit more of an open gallery, a place to sit down and take a break after your journey. It features a lot of different fern species um, as well as um, a few others. We had a couple palms, a couple cycads in there, but mainly ferns and really uh, feels like a step back maybe even further in time uh, to some of those uh, ancient plants. And a place to, to slow down. There's also a really great living wall in that space. Yeah, living walls. People love the living walls. <laughs> So <laughs> very photographable. Yes, people stand in front of them. Yeah. And, and they're not the easiest things to to get no, established. <laughs> very true. Plants don't easily grow vertically. No, no, directly vertically on a man-made wall. I mean, maybe outside, but yeah, trying to just having my experience at work trying to do that. It's like a uh, hit and miss. And then it's like, okay, finally, these these species want to grow on it. I have to go back to the Victoria Amazonica, though, because everyone loves the giant lily. Um, how big is that, is the leaf? Um, our leaves, I mean, the leaves can get up to what, six feet across? Yeah, I think so. I've been up to wild. eight, but we don't see uh, yeah. that ours can, we're get Ours will get between five and six feet across when, when they're really in high mm. season, so mid-summer. And then, you know, we'll get the, the bloom, the story for the bloom is pretty awesome too. And we'll get one or two blooms a week on that as well. And those are pretty sizable maybe six inches across wow and does it go dormant in the winter um you know we get seed every year to restart okay. sometimes they will make it through the winter like I do a lot of like babying of that plant <laughs> uh, when it gets this time of year and and sometimes I can coax it through the winter and then we extend the bloom season but if not we start seeds as well in the winter so we'll get seeds in December and have six foot leaves by June that's crazy is pretty that is amazing we would love to grow one at the conservatory but we've absolutely no space for it <laughs> yeah, we can do it there. I mean, we don't, we're like, where do we have six feet of water space? Uh, nowhere. 
<laughs> so <laughs> I'm willing to sacrifice some plants though to grow it because it's pretty darn amazing. I mean, it's a showstopper. And is that like, how do you decide? And I know for us at the conservatory, we have to have certain plants because they're brought in and used in labs and what students are seeing. Um, but how do you guys decide what you're going to bring in, what your what your goal is for educating the public? And so tell us a little bit about that and how do you go and source it? And then do you just do you ever just decide, no, this plant's not cutting for us. We're going to get rid of it. That's a great question. And the question that everybody who's ever had a garden or a, a window in their house full of house plants struggles with and the biggest challenge out there, right? Because, you know, for us, there's absolutely, I don't even know, thousands and thousands and thousands of species of tropical plants out there. And we have a limited footprint and, you know, we have to make strategic and thoughtful choices mm -hmm. about what we out. So um, this is one of the reasons that that Sarah and I uh, work so closely together because um, there's there's two things we need to think about when we're choosing plants. One is what's going to thrive, what's going to do well and perform well and be, be beautiful in the space. And then the other part of that is um, what what story do we have to tell about that plant? Like you said, um, plants have stories and at the Conservatory of Flowers, our mission is to connect people and plants. So our, our best way to connect is to tell the, the stories of those individual plants. So we have to make sure that we hit both those things when we're choosing to put a plant in. You want to add anything to that, Sarah? Yeah, just I think there's kind of two layers to that. We have each of the galleries that have their own story and some plants that can be really helpful in telling that overall story of the gallery or the ecosystem that it's representing. And then there are plants that individually have really incredible stories. Um, and sometimes those stories tell even bigger stories about maybe why the tropics are uh, such important places or um, what that greater uh, system that they're part of is with their, their interactions with other species that they live around. So um, there's kind of multiple factors that come into play that what makes uh, not just a good story as in it's interesting, but also what is a story that fits into the bigger story of, of what we're trying to tell at the conservatory. Yeah, because... And, and I'd like... Go, go ahead. ahead. Nope, go ahead. <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to add to that, that, um, you know, I'm a firm believer in the more has the better, and particularly the more creative input, the better. So, uh, you know, my team of horticulturists includes four of us total, including myself, and each of the horticulturists has in the sign gallery, as I mentioned before. So there's a lot of um, direct creative input and vision from those individual horticulturists in those galleries. And they're collaborating with Sarah as well to um, create a cohesive story through the galleries and a cohesive design. So plants are selected to perform well, but also to have um, an aesthetic design and tell And um, there's a lot of collaboration that goes in there that I think is important to highlight. Yeah, I'm just thinking of you have a lot of in-ground beds, which is great because you could set the whole scene for, like you were saying, that ecosystem and that area versus you know, your Victorian area where you have just um, – or your display area where things are in pots, which I personally – I love that area. Uh, <laughs> but because that's like, oh, I want my house to look like that. That's what you know people want there. But the in-ground beds, I think, tell that whole entire story because you could um, – you know, you could see, oh, the understory plants and the mid-level plants and then the plants up high and how they interact. And, you know, without even a lot of like uh, wordage, people could see, oh, and especially when people come in and they see a house plant and then they see the house plant, how it would grow in the wild. And I think that actually helps them become better gardeners. So even though, you know, that sort of as far as educating, you know, we want to, I think, teach people about plants and the ecosystem. You know, a lot of people who are visiting are into plants. So when they see a plant they're growing and how it grows in the wild, and most people can't travel all the all over the world to see it, that's what's so important about botanical gardens is I think it sort of solidifies that, wow, this plant is actually native to somewhere and this is how it grows. And these are the conditions, what makes it happy. And then it sort of just tells that big picture. That's a great point, Marlene, because when when 
um, the nursery specialists on, on my team are are thinking about putting a new plant in. The first thing that we're all looking at is where does that plant grow and mm-hmm. how does it grow? And you're right, by us putting it into that naturalistic context and people can be have a better sense of how the plants grow in nature and what they need to adjust in their house to, to help them thrive. I mean, yeah. People ask, do I care for my orchid? Which of course <laughs> they're talking about the Thonopsis, Thonopsis orchid they have at home. And we can get into how many totally different orchids we have here, but um, just that conversation is a great jumping off point to understanding how dramatically different orchids lives are uh, in the wild compared to in that little pot of bark in your house, but um, how also you're replicating that uh, wild environment in some ways and how you would care for it. So yeah, I think people who are interested in growing plants, it really is a great uh, jumping off point for all of these bigger insights. Yeah. I mean, it, it, people are used to getting the orchid. And first of all, a lot of people only think there's one orchid because they see the phalaenopsis at the store and then it's in a pot with bark. And I don't think they put two and two together that when they see them growing in a natural setting, that that's where they grow up in, in in the canopies of the trees. So, you know, you could go to a conservatory or another botanic garden and just see all the orchids in pots. And that's sort of going to just solidify, oh yeah, my orchid grows in a pot in bark, but you guys have it set up so naturally that it, um, you know, people are like, oh, that makes sense. That's why it's growing in bark because it's mimicking the substrate that's up there. So- yeah, at least I mean I think that that's what we try to do at the conservatory to educate people too and try to try to bring that home. Do you have? Um, yeah. Go ahead. Also, it's just nice to put the orchid in context, right? Like in our cloud forest gallery, we've got all these lovely, just jewel-like orchids. But to put them next to you know the giant tropical blueberry or the giant begonias or ferns, or you know, put it in context of the the incredible biodiversity that's in the tropics that's just growing alongside those orchids. So they're part of, with their companion plants, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Do you ever do displays like, um, I mean, with the existing plants you have, do you ever switch it up and say, okay, this um, this month we're doing um, you know, medicinal plants of the rainforest. This month we're doing textile plants of the rainforest. Um, is that a, is that sort of a, a mission to do um, different things like that? At one point, the conservatory was doing rotating displays in the <laughs> West Gallery, the <laughs> gallery that is um, uh, the landing point at this point, the, the seating place. Um, we've moved away from that, uh, you know, it was an incredible amount of, um, time investment and, and resource investment to rotate, like, as you can imagine, yes. the planning. <laughs> so, and I think that, you know, by, in, by directing that energy and effort back into the permanent galleries where we're, you know, really thoughtful about, um, the display and story that we're creating, or day by day as people arrive. And also I think for the plants themselves, Mm -hmm. um, I think when they settle into a spot, um, we do do a lot of rotating plants in and out and potted plants, but the other galleries, um, plants tend to to be placed and stay put for a while and then they can adapt and adjust. So I think that's better for them. It doesn't mean that we don't overlay from time to time, like a holiday display or something in that West Gallery where we have that open space. Um, But yeah, I think we're moving more towards the um, more staid and steady. Yeah. And I wasn't even thinking of rotating displays because I mean, like I said, I like what I like about and I'm jealous about is you have a lot of in-ground beds. So you don't really have the ability to move these plants, nor do you want to because they're super happy in ground. I was just simply thinking, throw up a few signs. That's what I would do. Hey, this one's this, this one's this. That would be my lazy way of doing it. Maybe that's why I'm not an interpretive scientist because I would just... Well, that's actually a good point, Marlene. Maybe Sarah can talk about... Because actually we do kind of do what you're... Now that I understand what you're talking bit. about. Yeah, so I, I make these small chalkboard signs that go out into our galleries. And I really love the uh, ephemeral nature of these chalkboards and how they're made by hand and they can change uh, kind of at a moment's notice. They're not permanent interpretive signs. And 
I guess so far I haven't tried to do a cohesive theme across a gallery or the building with those, but now you're giving me an idea. It's possible. <laughs> um, but those signs are really helpful because they can just be plopped in a spot and uh, yeah. you know, tell a story spreads up in a, in a location when suddenly plants are assembling themselves. Uh, yeah. Perhaps thanks to Kristen and her team's astute recognition of like, oh, we can put all of these together and it will you know, create this corner that uh, creates an opportunity to uh, then share that. Yeah, because people always ask us, they're like, oh, do you have signage? And I'm like, well, you know, the, our mission isn't necessarily fully public. But then if if I were to say, OK, I, I'm going to put some, you know, interpretive signs, some educational signs on the plants, they would probably be five pages long because I wouldn't be able to narrow down. You know, I'd have to tell the whole entire story. And they'd be like, well, that plant's pretty cool, too. That So it would just be signs everywhere. So It takes longer to say less. Yes. Is my, is yes. I realized. My job is the the less time I have, the more I end up just trying to cram into uh, a sign or any other medium. And then if I have time, just like, okay, but what, what is the one point I want to make here? It's treacherous, but (laughs) if I have enough time to it, and and that's important because because people can only absorb so much. So you have to keep it short and sweet. And it's hard though, when you're geeking out about a plant and you're just like, I want to tell you everything. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we keep that on our toes because also it's like the opportunistic moment. Like, you know, we try to be good about saying, oh, this is coming out or this is coming in bloom or this is going to happen. But we don't always, sometimes things catch us by surprise and we have to like jump on the moment and, and, you know, pull together some content, get it on social, get it on a sign and, and get people excited about something in the moment. And that's what I love about the chalkboard signs and social media in general is to be able to like seize the, the opportunity as it comes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you were talked about orchids. So how many species do you have of orchids? several hundred let's just go with that okay are also um i'm I'm sure you can relate to this too we don't have a full inventory we're working on recataloging our collection that's an ongoing Mm. endless process that not for you as well Mm -hmm. yep oh yeah yeah. and then things die too and then (laughs) they don't get taken out of the database but (laughs) Yeah, or they divide, or somebody moves, or we lose a label, mm-hmm. or whatever. So yeah. one day we'll be able to give you a precise number. <laughs> At some point, we can say several hundred species, um, and there's some of them are so tiny too. Some of them are so tiny, the label's bigger than the plant. <laughs> That's what I love about the cloud forest orchids. Yes, they're um, tiny. Yeah. So if you decide, I mean, who decides on if they want? So you have horticulturalists who are in charge, and then you have Sarah, who's sort of in charge of the, you know, the the education aspect of it. Um, say someone who's taking care of an area says, I really want this plant. I really think this plant is going to help our, um, you know, our display. It'll do well in here. Do you all have to agree upon it? Um and then how do you source it? Do you try to source from other botanic gardens or how do you make sure that you're getting the right, um, you know, information from it and the provenance? Those are great questions and something that we have um, had a lot of discussion around, given a lot of thought to. I think any, you know, formal collection will really think those questions through in depth. Um, what we have is a written plant collection policy that helps outline, you know, answers to some of those questions, helps provide us guidelines and, and guidance for those questions. I am um, the plant collection manager for that policy. So uh, anything new coming in or anything leaving really does require my approval. Um, but with that, it's, it's a discussion and a collaborative process. Also, one of the things that we've given a lot of thought to is ethical sourcing. Mm-hmm. I'm sure that's for you all as well, yeah. that especially with the, you know, boom in, in houseplant collections that happened during COVID, um, we saw a huge rise in um, plants being sold on eBay and Etsy and, and online um, that don't have clear um, origins and some of which uh, unfortunately could very well have been collected illegally from the wild. We're very sensitive about that, particularly because we are a tropical collection. So we do um, think about 
you know, our, our first preference is to trade with other formal uh, public collections like UC Davis and um, Huntington Collection and UC Berkeley and um, other partners we have with tropical collections, Atlantic Botanical Garden, places like that, because um, we have a strong sense that those collections also have an ethical standard for sourcing. But also we will get from um, growers and vendors and then we ask them questions. We ask them tough questions about where they get their plants so we can make sure that we are uh, being ethical in our sourcing. Yeah, it's a big problem with with the tropical plants. And then it's always been an ongoing issue with succulents. So we see that you know, because we have a lot of succulents and it's just poaching going out. And of course, the California native, the the Dudleyas, we know that they're being poached and and sold off. So it's it's a big problem. People need to do their homework. If it looks too good to be true or someone's selling so many of them and you know the plant is rare, um, yeah, do your research. But we have we have wild collected specimens in our collection, but you know, they were done with permits back in, you know, in the 19 well, uh, who knows if they had permits back in the 1960s. We like to think they were botanists going out there. Um nowadays, you know, it's very much if someone says, "Oh, I wild collected this plant," we're just going to give them look at them and be like, "No, you poached it." <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's a slippery slope, especially when you have an older collection. How you explain sometimes? Well, that's actually a great story we like to tell. Do you want to talk about that a little bit, Sarah? About the collection history and in ways we can talk about that. I, mean, I think especially because our building is sort of a, a Victorian era building mm-hmm. with a potted plant tower that displays uh, plants in a Victorian era style. Um, it is a, an opportunity to talk about plant collecting back in that time and sort of with a, a critical lens and uh, remind people that plant collecting and colonization went hand in hand, especially in the kind of early days of uh, this conservatory and a lot of greenhouses like it, and that today we have an opportunity to uh, either continue that history or change it. And I think that's what the policy that Kristen Steen uses is uh, kind of an extension of that is um, making sure that greenhouses like this, uh, gardens like this, conservatories um, are uh, sharing that history. And um, yeah, because it- providing a better future. Yeah. I mean, during the Victorian era, that was sort of the first, I don't know, I'm sure they're first like big quote houseplant push. And that's where, you know, these rich people had people who were able to just go out and travel and they literally just dug up every, you know, orchid, lady slippers, orchids, and because they wanted them in their house. So it was absolutely no uh, you know, like, hmm, we'll collect seed or let's do this properly. It was just like, dig them up, ship them. Let's put them in our beautiful Victorian greenhouses. And with, um, so yeah, that is, that is a history of it back then. And then have you noticed, then they named them all after themselves. (laughs) 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 Well, of course, I mean, (laughs) and then you're like, look at my beautiful orchids that I grew. And then, you know, if they died, you just, you know, sent someone to go, you know, collect more of them. Um, so yeah, I was not, not properly done. They left beautiful, you know, Victorian greenhouses, but unfortunately, you know, the whole history of how they went about getting the plants for it. Not so nice. Not so nice. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, go ahead. And also we are, a, um, an official plant rescue center, with fish and wildlife as well. Okay. So we would all receive plants that are confiscated that have not entered the, the country legally. And that's another way to support that ethic and um, the laws and regulations that are now exist. Yeah, uh, we worked with Fish and Game too, and we've had um, some Dudleyas um, come our way. So they probably send the tropical plants to you that they confiscate. And then we get the dead Leas. And sadly, what happens is even though they confiscate them, they can't, we can't put them back in, um, in the ground because we don't know exactly the location. So if you then just take these plants and you start moving them around, you're introducing possible plant pathogens and pests. So even though we have these plants and they've been confiscated, people don't realize that 
Well, you can't just go back and plant them unless you know exactly where they're at. And even then, um, because there's issues with that. So it's, it's ideally it's stopping before you even get to that point, but I'm glad these people are being caught. Agreed. Um, what, so, uh, you know, I, I don't think any plant should be rare. Um, one, I'm sure you guys probably feel the same way. Your rarest plants are probably the most nerve wracking. I don't want to be responsible for the death of a plant that's rare. So we try to propagate as much as we can of rare plants and get them out there to other botanical uh, universities. Do you guys have a program where you're purposely propagating certain plants and trying to get them out there? Or is it more if a university asks you or a, a conservatory asks you? That's a good question. And one of the one of the questions we can ask is what what does rare mean mm -hmm. in this context? And and maybe Sarah, you can speak to that first and then I'll speak to how we um, propagate. Yeah, I when I think of rare plants, one category is of course plants that are endangered or threatened or have one of those designations that their population is in decline. And then the other group are plants that just have a very small range and are endemic to a tiny era. There's a plant called the Osa pultra that is a species that grows in just a tiny section of Costa Rica and Panama. It's just finishing up one round of blooming right now. And we're one of few gardens to have this plant on display. So it's one of the most rare plants here, but it's not technically an endangered plant. It's just got a tiny range. Of course, any plant with a small range is still going to be more... Uh, susceptible to losing its habitat and disappearing. Um, yeah. And then there are some plants here that are, we do know, to be in, extinct in the wild. So, yeah, the Osa, I, would, I, I was just going to say the Osa is one of what I consider one of our rare plants as well. And anytime someone wants one, we always give them cuttings, but it, it's not the easiest to propagate from cuttings. I don't know how, uh, I, I don't know if we gave you guys a cutting or. I think I came from you oh, actually. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, we great. I was doing great. I, but also I would add to another category of rare, what often people coming into the conservatory when they say, what are your rare plants? What they're thinking about is rare in cultivation, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. it could be really common in the wild, but not that that present in not that many people have it mm -hmm. and that's generally when people are thinking about what's rare it's what can I see that I wouldn't see somewhere else or that you know there there are plants that um I I would say for instance the amorphous titanum the, the um titan arum which gets enormous press it is it is rare in the in the wild is now endangered but um almost every tropical conservatory has one Mm -hmm. right of blooming so it's not as rare necessarily in cultivation um so yeah that's one of the questions that comes up is what what is rare and what does rare mean yeah that we well but also in answer to your question of what we do one of the things i love about working with tropical plant collections is that tropical plant people share plants so readily because there's a it's it's a win-win there's no there's no loss right mm -hmm. you can take a, a cutting off of a tropical plant. They propagate, a lot of them propagate really readily and it's going to be no loss to your plant. And then you share it around just as you were talking about, Ronnie, just as you did with sharing a plant with us. And then um, we all have insurance pl plants in other collections. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, I mean, I, I want that. I don't want to be the, I don't want to be known as the only conservatory with a plant because one that means that plant is incredibly critically endangered and two you know it's even though it's inside a greenhouse lots could happen <laughs> lots could happen we may not have the habitat destruction out in the wild but there are pests and diseases and all it takes is you know someone forgetting to water it or overwatering it and i don't want that pressure on me and i want everyone to enjoy these plants a a as well so um but of course sometimes it goes hand in hand and like you said with tropical plants it's generally they're easy to propagate and it could just be the habitat destruction that's why there's limited numbers but like the osa you know it's pollinated by you know, a very large moth. So it's so, and, and it's in a small range. So it doesn't really set a lot of seed. And as I was saying, I find it a pain to propagate by cutting. So <laughs> maybe you guys could yeah. give me some tips, but so the, yeah, there's various things that is, it is true about rare. Cause you'll go on Etsy and someone will be selling this variegated aeroid and say, oh, it's rare. Well, 
at sort of a market pushed rare to rarity for most of them. <laughs> Your description market push, yes. <laughs> so you asked whether we do this sort of in a formal structured way, and I would say no. This okay. kind of happens organically. I love to invite other collection folks like yourself and your team and other teams over to I love to do field trip trades where we, you know, we go visit other collections. We have um collection folks from board cultures from other collections come visit us and then there's a great uh dialogue comes out of that and all kinds of plant sharing happens and i just make sure that i document so that i know where my insurance pieces landed mm -hmm. and if i can i said you know um uh collection you know identification numbers the accession numbers we call them with the plant to that new place, I also make sure I write down the accession numbers of plants that I receive, and mm -hmm. we just kind of keep a little record. Yeah, yeah. What is a plant that is on your wish list? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I just threw that at you. <laughs> or what is maybe what is something you guys are trying to acquire or thinking about? Oh, we need we need these plants or this plant. I would say that, that I can't say a specific plant, but I would say the collection that we're probably most like thoughtful and intentional about would be our cloud forest collection because there mm -hmm. aren't that many cloud forest collections out there. No. Cloud forest plants are so finicky. They are, have a very narrow range of tolerance for climate and humidity. So when we find um, folks that are growing those and growing them well, we definitely like to make friends and, and share. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to joke that, you know, San Francisco is almost like a cloud forest. You really, exactly. like, you just need to take the lid off of the conservatory on some days and it's it's a cloud forest. So... <laughs> There are some plants that are growing in our cloud forest gallery that I know will also grow in someone's backyard here. No problem. It's crazy. Um, not awesome, but <laughs> it's so crazy. Yeah. And, and just for people who aren't in this area, I'm about maybe 90, 80 to 90 minutes away from San Francisco. But on days where it's 100 and literally this has happened where it's been 110 where I'm at, I've driven 90 minutes over and it's been 50 degrees and foggy in San Francisco. It's, yep. it's so bizarre. It's just this, all, this crazy micro uh, climate. And then within San Francisco, I know people who live in San Francisco are like, well, I live on these two blocks and we're this zone. And, um, but <laughs> it's not to say though, that, you know, you guys are doing a phenomenal job in the greenhouse growing cloud forest. You have it set, set up and it's an amazing ecosystem with, uh, the plants are, um, amazing. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you could people love going and seeing cloud forest because there's so many layers to that forest as well. There's so many epiphytes and there's tall plants and there's vines, but then there's creepy crawlers on the floor. It's so true. It's such a, it's so dense with plant life. That's like the beauty of that ecosystem. It's just completely just, just concentrated with plant life and for that. And so animal life would follow mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. um, how is your, your, you have a pretty good carnivorous plant, plant collection as well. Yes. Thanks to UC Davis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Conservatory Yale have given us plenty of, um, oh, Nepenthes over uh, the years. Yes. I think, we, I think we've traded Nepenthes for sure. Um, we have a good helium four collection. Helium four is a tricky plant to grow, and uh, as you know, just grows exclusively on tapuis in South America, those high, high, high plateaus. Um, and those are probably our features, the two that we feature. We have some scattered other plants that, you know, in the potted plants gallery, we'll expand a little bit beyond the tropical for things that are truly interesting and curious and captivating, like some of the drosteros. Yeah. And you guys have them set up really nice. We have to have ours, you know, in pots and we have to trim them back. Um, but you guys are able to display them like they would be growing just, you know, up, up in the canopy. So every time I come there and I, it's almost like doing the where's Waldo with your plants sometimes, you know, the more you look at one spot, the more species you see in it, you're like, Ooh, I didn't see that tiny little fern. Ooh, I didn't see that. And that's, I mean, that's the fun of the conservatory there is you're just like looking at all the little, the little, um, uh, plants there. 
Uh, the place is so entrepreneurial here too. Uh, they take advantage of the building architecture in some really funny ways. Like the Nepenthes, especially, they climb along the irrigation line to go to the gallery to provide this natural climbing surface for them. So that works out well. As we were walking around the other day, and someone asked about how a fern had gotten up and it just had kind of plunged itself into the into the ceiling in one one spot. Um, and I love watching how the the plants take advantage of the environment here in some really funny ways that are perhaps unnatural, but are still replicating their natural growth habit. It's really odd. Yeah. Sometimes it just happens. You're like, I'm leaving that there. That's perfect. <laughs> what would you say, you know, the morphophallus we mentioned, that's always, you know, always makes the news. It's people want it, you know, it's, it's, I joke that, you know, it's an inflorescence that, you know, smells like a dead body. So people line up around the greenhouse to come and smell a flower it smells like a dead body. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's beautiful as well. But what is a flower that you guys are surprised that when it is in bloom, people are, or is there one particular plant that you're like, wow, this one gets more noticed than others? And we're surprised about that. Mm. Um, yeah, there are a few. There's one that uh, is called the bat flower. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe, maybe familiar with it. Mm -hmm. But it's always a head turner it's such a unique looking plant and it also has a inflorescence but also these really dramatic whisker-like structures and it, it's just very uh elegant and uh, always gets comments of wow look at that you know i think anyone who um walks by just has a moment with it and it, it's pretty good at blooming too so i, I love that that plant is I constantly people in the potted plants gallery and i also love that plant story as a that those dramatic whiskers I mentioned, they, there isn't a conclusion of why this plant has these. And it, I love stories where scientists have tried to untangle, what is this adapted for? It must have a reason. It's really odd. And we haven't come up with an answer yet. And um, that's just a story of how there's no, uh, there's no knowing at all with plants. Or, oh, really? Uh, what, what is the pollinator? What is the pollinator for those? I don't know. I that. think it's tiny, tiny flies although i think they're pretty good at self-pollinating too and that was I think one of the studies that was done with that plant they were theorizing that maybe the whiskers were literally mimicking whiskers of a mammal and that these little biting flies that would suck mammal blood would uh, be attracted thinking that they were going to come get a blood meal and instead they're visiting the flower um but they did a study where they trimmed the, the whiskers off the flowers and uh didn't notice any difference in pollination rate so okay that that's pretty Spike against that theory. Uh, so the mystery continues. That's pretty funny. Trimming the whiskers off to see. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I love that plant. We had one years ago and sadly we lost it and we haven't been able to, I mean, I know you could find them online, but every time I go to like buy one from like Logies or something, they're sold out. But I think oh, you guys well, just had that posted because it, as soon as I said, what is another plant that's a showstopper, you know, besides the, uh, the giant lilies? That's the one that came to my mind because I've had someone drive all the way from Oregon down and see when ours was in bloom. Um, uh, they're like, when's well, it in we'll bloom? Share one back with you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now I know you guys have some. So, <laughs> yes. No, <it's> <laughs> As a surprise, too, is the jade vine when it bloomed earlier oh, this yeah. summer. I think I've seen photos of they, they bloom pretty prolifically in the tropics and they're pretty common or ornamental there. Um, okay. But And we have a pretty massive plant that's kind of growing over a doorway, but it doesn't bloom too often. Or at least I've been here for three years and it bloomed for the first time. Okay, so now so, you guys are just rubbing here. it in about your bat plant and the jade vine because that jade vine yeah. is actually... Oh, the jade vine we have, I have big issues with it. So we did get a cutting from Logies and it's from the one they have in their greenhouse that has bloomed for years and years. So I know it's, you know, not some one-off bizarre um, seed grown one. It's gotten to a great size. It's rooted into the ground. It gets plenty of light. It's never bloomed for us. And I, I said, okay, this is the year I'm cutting it all down and I'm moving it. Well, I cut it all the way down. And then I'm like, well, I won't move it. Maybe this will trigger it to grow back in flower. Now it's all the way back, taking over the whole entire spot. And it stills never flowered for us. You know, we have not figured out what the trigger is. It just does what it wants when it wants. And that's the thing about taking care of plants, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you got to go with it. Oh, okay. I thought maybe you guys had a secret. Bummer. I don't hear it. Oh, sorry. Um, I think the other thing that people get excited about is kind of what you talked about earlier, which is to see the plants when they, you know, 
I like to say that, you know, we should have plants in the conservatory that people can't grow in their house, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or to the size that they can't really have space for in their house. So just when when we let things just go wild and get tremendous in size, um, or their relatives of, you know, every, everybody's got a little philodendron in their office, but when we have massive philodendron that gets 60 feet tall with the six foot leaves, just how big things can be in the tropics. Yeah. And, and then going along with that is also edible plants. Like you guys have a chocolate, I believe. So, um, you guys have chocolate, right? Yeah. Yeah. People okay. do, yeah yes. The, the fruiting plants we some new bananas coming in right now, some jackfruit, um, a number of spice uh, plants as well, like a curry leaf, allspice. And then um, those are all in the lower tropics. And that definitely is a nice connection because really to these plants that they've eaten. And I, I love chocolate as a fun one with the kids too, because they realize that chocolate is a fruit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm I mean, really excited about the bananas though. Yeah. You realize how, how many people don't actually have a sense of where they're getting their bananas from. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm still show people vanilla orchids and they're still like, Oh, and then they go, I guess I never really thought, or because you say vanilla bean and they thought it was like, you know, a small bean bush or something, but when you show it to them. So, I mean, I always find that it amazing that kids and adults alike, sometimes you get the same reaction. Well, that would be an answer to, to your question earlier about what plant do you wish we had. We do have some um, some vanilla orchids, um, but I wish that they would just bloom and be very charismatic. Yeah. And they don't bloom very <laughs> often. Tell their story better because yeah. it's such a wonderful story, and then the plant is just, it doesn't bloom that often, and it's. Yeah. <laughs> and you all have some lovely vanillas. Marley. We Let's do. We we just, a scary story is we had this vanilla and it got cut back really far. And we were just noticing, I'm like, oh, we might get some bloom soon. And we had, a, it's growing on our chocolate and we had a student prune the chocolate. And then I walked in the next day and I looked down and I saw a vanilla flower. And I'm like, oh, oh. no. I'm like, oh, please uh, you know, we had no idea. So I'm scrambling, looking up, trying to find these clusters of flowers. But it was it was at like my chest height. It was blooming really low. And no one, we didn't notice it, but we managed to pollinate three flowers. So we have three uh, fruits forming, which is good. Yeah. So, but we have that vanilla, the Imperialis, which is the huge one. Unfortunately, you know, the the fruits don't smell like vanilla. They smell a little like fermented fruit, but it has an amazing um, pod on it. So um, give it time. Your vanilla will be fine. See, at least we're doing something. We can't get our jade vine and we don't have the bat flower, but <laughs> we got the vanilla. <laughs> Yeah, so that we can share this. Yeah, we have a, a the variegated uh, vanilla as well and a few other species, I think. So, yeah. Um. So I could talk to you guys all day about the conservatory and we didn't even touch, you know, I was like making a list of things I wanted to talk about, you know, but I think just, it's just interesting as someone who works at a conservatory that's, you know, not on your scale, but we try to pack a lot in that it's interesting to see how you operate and how you decide. Um, And you are more organized than us because I think you are bigger and you have more employees. So just deciding what you're going to bring in sometimes plants show up where I'm at work and I'm like, where the heck did this come from? Where's this? And we're all scrambling. <laughs> who brought this? And it turns out it's just some student who brought in there. Hey, I thought you needed this begonia. Here it is. And it's like, I, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, what, what, where can people find you? What are your, where's all your, uh, your, your website and your social? Yeah. So we are at conservatoryofflowers.org. Um, and, our social is just conservatory of flowers as well um and yeah as i mentioned earlier we're now part of the gardens of golden gate park so we can actually buy a ticket that can uh admit you to all three gardens in a day or become a member of all three and um, also you can visit all three for free if you're a san francisco resident um so and you guys are open seven days seven days a week six six Who's on monday okay for, okay um, taking care of of everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, even though you're closed, people are still there. Plants don't, you know, plants don't take a day off. That's, what's, you know, it's like someone's like, oh, are you still, are you working from home? I'm like, no, I I, I was never working from home. The plants didn't, <laughs> plants didn't know there was a thing called COVID. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Thank goodness. You know, that was nice. But, um, well, thanks. Thanks for joining me. And I will have you back on and then we could go like a little bit deeper into your soil mixes and your pest control and how, um, you know, everything gets operated on there. So, um, that's great. yeah. So until next time, everyone, happy gardening.